This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Catherine Robert and I are going to talk about narrative. I've been getting a lot of questions about narrative, about voice, about point of view, and... uh, So we thought we would address the topic or at least have a conversation about it. (laughs) A good starting point is always to define narrative. And I like to think of it as the water that the fish are swimming in. So within your story, you've got your characters, you've got your setting, you've got your plot, which is the action that occurs, the events that carry our characters through the setting, through this world you've created, right? So what is the narrative? Everything. Everything is the narrative. It is the water the fish are swimming in. You need a storyteller to tell that story to the reader. So every word on the page that is not dialogue in quotes or you know, a real straightforward action like a stage direction would be telling us what somebody is doing in that moment is narrative. So this might be authorial, in which case the narrator becomes invisible. And as readers, we can forget that the narrator exists because we're just entering that world. We're in the water, right? So we aren't thinking about the water that we're swimming through with these characters. But narrative describes the world. It sets the mood. It gives us the tone of the piece or the voice. All of those intangible things that go into making a story, those are the narrative. So if we think of character setting and plot as our tangibles, kind of the the stuff you could construct on the stage in a theater, Those are our tangibles. Narrative is everything else that draws a reader into the story. Um, As such, we must have a narrator, right? So authorial or personified. In lit theory, that would be the essayist narrator. But we can think of it as a storyteller with personality. Somebody who presents on the page external to the story. Right. So the invisible authorial narrator or the storyteller. All first person stories have a storyteller. They have a personified narrator. Third person, you get to pick. Is it an authorial narrator or is it the personified storyteller? So I'm going to pause there and let you guys (laughs) respond or ask a question. But I think that Hopefully that gives us a sense of what we're going to be talking about. Actually, I, I really like the idea of the, the fish in the water um, because, you know, that that's the age-old Zen thing of do the fish know that they're swimming in water? You know, well, right. you know, we don't, we don't <laughs> perceive our air around us. You know, we just know that it supports us and keeps us alive. So the thing that keeps mm-hmm. the story alive is the, the thing that the story is buried in, which is the narrative. And because – Fish don't necessarily, we think they don't know they're swimming through water. I'm sure they do. Right. <laughs> and they credit the fish with far more intelligence than humans. Um, and uh, I think that that's where it leads writers into confusion because they haven't necessarily separated that out. They don't, you know, they're not seeing the water for the fishes type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. So I think the, the idea of separating that out and making it a thing um, is a really good idea because you say, okay, well, is it fast flowing water? Is it muddy water? Is it rough water? Is it a, a river? Is it an ocean? And that kind of gives you, I don't know, I'm being very thematic here, but mm-hmm. it gives you some way of slanting. You know, and I th- if I think back to my current working progress where we've got first person present tense, um, female POV mm-hmm. and no other POVs, um, it's easy to get sucked into the fact that the story is simply told through her point of view which is it's expressed through her point of view but the moments where she's not actually saying anything or thinking anything specifically 
it's still coming in through her head. And that's where mm-hmm. we get the potential, I think, to have the sort of very modern day thing of the unreliable narrator, where the narrative becomes unreliable because you think it's the truth of what's in the person's head, but they, you know, we withhold things from ourselves. <laughs> we have mm-hmm. uh, a lens through which we see the world. So I think, you know, it was it was interesting when I came to that conclusion right at the start of writing the the trilogy is that you know oh i can be different in these parts all the same you know Mm -hmm. she could be similar to how she acts and talks and speaks and thinks or the reflective narrative could be slightly different showing uh you know a different side of her personality that maybe gives the story some extra fabric Mm -hmm. um so, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I think it's it's a really interesting thing to play with because we, we're used to doing actions, emotions, descriptions, settings, dialogue, all right. those, as you say, really tangible things. Uh-huh. And maybe we're taught to veer away from narrative because, oh, there's exposition, you know, <laughs> and it, it's completely different. It's not, narrative right. is not exposition. I'll be part of it, but you know, it's a- right. Well, let's talk about exposition a little bit. I think that mm-hmm. a lot of writers believe exposition is a dirty word, and it's not. Exposition mm-hmm. is your best friend, right? Mm-hmm. The word exposition comes from expose. So to expose, to explain, to expound upon, to make clear. And this is what we want our narrative to do for a reader. So narrative exposition is the bulk of narrative. You know, it's kind of like people think show don't tell that telling is everything that's not action, but that's not true. Right? Telling is a type of narrative exposition that is falling flat, Mm. that is not functioning properly in the story that when something could be delivered to a reader, in a much more dramatic, dynamic, effective, moving way. So one of my favorite words talking about story craft is compelling because something could be, you could have a moment of silence with a character doing nothing described on the page in narrative exposition. But if that moment is perfectly placed within the story and resonates with meaning, it will compel us deeper into the story. It will advance the story and the character. We will have a greater sense of understanding and depth, right? So um, narrative exposition is the stuff from which we get voice and tone and mood. You know, if, if you want to if we lead into mood from that jumping off point, we can think of what we do with words on the page in terms of what directors do mm. with film. And if you want to look at something very noir, say like Blade Runner, versus, which is futuristic and very noir in style, um, or a classic noir detective story versus something like a Dr. Zhivago, right? Or a Saving Private Ryan or Mm. whatever. The feeling of those stories, completely different. You know, when Harry met Sally, completely different. So no matter what genre you're in, you're going to create a feeling. And that is done separate from the personalities of your characters, separate from your characters POVs or perspectives and worldviews separate from the setting in which the action occurs. That's all narrative. It's interesting, isn't it, that in the visual media, such as movies or stage, you would not expect to notice the direction. You would expect it to be invisible. Um, mm-hmm. in, yet in prose, we're we kind of we kind of avoid being visible, and, and maybe that's where the the whole showdown don't tell thing tends to tends to arise from because you'll never see in a good stage play or a, a movie 
the director leaping into frame and saying, no, look, this bit's really good coming up. Uh -huh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, um, but there's a temptation to, to flag things here with poor narration um, or, or with a poor narrative style. So I think that the, the distinction you made there between you know, exposition per se is not bad. It's just how it's executed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and mm -hmm. we would fully agree. I think, I think, isn't it Robert McKee who says uh, use exposition as ammunition? Um, so, you know, you try and deliver it in just-in-time moments, perhaps, you know, if that's the style you're using. Um, but then again, you know, you've got sweeping epic fancy dramas that Tolkien wrote where, you know, there's plenty of telling going on in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think of think of how your storyteller is going to describe a moment to the reader and what you want that description to evoke in or elicit from your reader. Right? So when you make a reader feel something, it's going to be through the way it's done, not simply through the fact that it occurred. I mean, we hear things on the news all the time about death and destruction and loss and tragedy and grief. And so we become desensitized to it. So the facts of those things do not move us. What moves us is when we are engaged with a palpable sensory experience. So if you hear uh, you know, somebody died in a car accident, you, you can say, okay, whatever. But if you are shown the crumpled car and, you know, the driver grieving over the passenger and the tears and the broken body and, right, and then you throw in some very specific detail that is unique, to that character and to that moment in time. And that can become the thing that that piece of specificity that sticks in the reader's mind, you know, so now, not only do you have the image and the sensory experience of the thing that's making you feel, but you've got that point of connection that that takes it into the space of intimacy, right? And that is all the work of good narrative. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a little nice. heady. Yeah. Is, yeah. There's is, a lot to think about. Yeah. And again, going back to your, you know, your metaphor of the, of the fish in the water, you're, you're in a way trying to make something uh, real that isn't that shouldn't necessarily be, visible in the in the conscious sense we shouldn't well we don't want to draw attention to hey look how i wrote that sentence above there wasn't it great mm -hmm. um you, you, but you're wanting to be evocative or, or 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 trigger imagery or emotions or all of those things right out, outside potentially of what a character is doing or saying um mm -hmm. so you know, within that, we've got all sorts of possibilities. So when people ask about, you know, subtext or, or mood or theme or all of those things, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. much of that can come through your narrative. I mean, obviously, it comes through the characters and their actions, without doubt. Um, but you're missing opportunities if you're not thinking about how your choice of, uh, you know, camera angle or you know, to to put a sort of metaphoric slant on prose mm -hmm. um, you know how do those things um shift the way the story is moving along right right and as the author we need to construct the story the way a director constructs a shot within a film you know so on the film or on the stage you've got your set designer your lighting designer your sound effects designer, you've got your cinematographer, you've got your director, you've got your actors, everybody is playing a part to collectively create a vision and an experience that the audience then, you know, lives vicariously. So we need to do that. We need to do that much work. But all we have are words and all we have mm -hmm. is ourselves. We don't have the team 
of people supporting us. So if you want to have a, a character who is sitting on a couch feeling morose, how are you going to make your reader experience a feeling of being morose? What are you going to do to create that world? Because you can't go into your reader's house and dim the lights or, you know, put the scent of stale ashtray in their reading room or, you know, uh, bring a fog down outside the house (laughs) or whatever we might visually and orally experience through the, through the film, through the cinema. So you need to make all of those choices and do it with words, which makes narrative vitally important, even more important than dialogue and action, right? Dialogue and action happens within the creation that we gain from narrative or the experience we gain from the narrative, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, actually, is to you know, reprioritize, really. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it'd be, I suppose, going through in a revision pass, you could make one of your revision passes completely about narrative style um, and consistency, because, it, 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 you know, it's one form of... Um, continuity isn't it really um actually if i think about it that's one of the things i i do struggle with is if i've had a break from a a work and come Mm -hmm. back to it picking up the voice right and and generally i'm sure most writers are the same generally what i'll have to do is reread a previous section so i can get Uh into the group get into the groove you know right pick up the vibe you (laughs) (laughs) yes yeah and that's normal and good practice to read some of what you've written before so that you can have that continuity of voice. And I would, you know, if you don't have an established voice in a piece, or if the voice isn't working, then absolutely do make it a point of your revision. But I would encourage everyone to do enough playing in the journal, free writing, experimenting, developing of scenes to find the voice, the story wants to be told in stories make demands on craft, right? Mm -hmm. And when you land on that voice, it's going to feel right and it's going to flow better than if you are trying to fix it later, trying to create a voice where one doesn't exist. You know, I would say in that case, it might be more efficient and less time consuming just to start over. You know, I have found yeah, I've had that true. experience yeah. myself where trying to fix a manuscript was painful and ineffective. But by just starting over, I could hit the flow state and, yeah. you know, write it much more efficiently. So. Catherine. That's true. <laughs> that voice is a product of your flow state, <laughs> like the voice of the. I don't want to say a product of, because then that makes it sound like the <laughs> unicorn that, you know, the elusive right. creature in the forest. Uh, it certainly c- happens more easily mm-hmm. in a flow state. But I think, you know, it can be a chicken or an egg where if you're in your voice, the flow state is going to happen because then you're inside the story, Right. right? If you're outside the story, the voice is going to be lost to you. Mm-hmm. So when you connect with the voice, that's why reading the previous day's pages are so effective for getting back in that voice, because right. that's when you enter the story. You know, if you aren't writing memoir, if you aren't writing from your own life, the voice should feel different than, than what you're sitting in. Mm -hmm. right then the voice in your head to some degree we're always putting on a narrative ethos there is always some sort of persona between me the author and the storyteller presenting the the story to the reader even if it's an authorial narrator Mm -hmm. and that's because every story is going to need a different narrative voice 
Yeah, I think it's great. I, think, you know, I like the idea that you're stepping a, across a threshold almost, you know, and it's as if, um, you know, if, if if you're struggling with it with your own story, then apart from the journaling techniques and, and you know, writing to develop a voice, mm-hmm. one way is, and I think this is why a lot of writers will will want, a, you know, a, either you know, a sacred space or a space they always write because mm-hmm. from a, straightforward stimulus response you want to anchor yourself to those flow states as much as possible so you want to be able to have your space trigger it but equally if you don't have that then you know most of us have experienced say you know going to a a nine to five uh, job and then coming home and just wanting to change out of those clothes Mm -hmm. and get into something else because (laughs) it triggers a different state completely um or, you know, just doing something that draws a line, which is, you know, I'm going to stop, have a coffee, and then get on with something. Mm-hmm. And I think if you – sometimes if you sort of rush in, okay, I've got to, do, I've got to get these words down, and you forget that you, you want to step across that threshold and become the director, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think that's a good way to – it won't necessarily, you know, summon the flow state, but it might help you think, okay, I'm now, I'm now the narrator. You know, right. I'm, I'm no longer the person sitting at the computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so those kind of techniques can help as well, I think, with being much more deliberate and conscious about – I mean, I say conscious. I mean, it, it, it's the antithesis of flow state. You don't right. want to be conscious, <laughs> but you want to be conscious that you want to enter that. Yes, and I think, you know, the more you work with and practice these elements, the more – grounded they can become in your subconscious mind so that I can be writing in a flow state but still have the author kind of sitting on my shoulder watching and going oh different word choice there okay got it back you know so Mm -hmm. so they work in tandem so initially when it's a new concept or a new skill we're developing we do need to be conscious and effortful but the more we practice, the less effort it takes, then pretty soon it recedes and becomes a part of the flow state, you know, mm. so we can have a kind of awareness that's helpful and soft instead of the critical voice that, you know, halts us in our tracks. Um, another thing that really helps with voice instead of just besides just reading your own pages to get the voice of your story is to read widely, read outside of your preferred Mm. genre, Mm. and read works with strong narratives so that you can study it. Find something that really excites you or really evokes a feeling response in you and copy it down, you know, flag it in the margin of your book. Spend time with it because that becomes something else in your subconscious mind that you can draw on when you're writing. Um, I know when we did, we brought samples of great prose and we did that episode reading those prose pieces. I read something from the great Gatsby and it might not have been the passage I'm about to refer to actually, but when the narrator, Nick Carraway introduces um, our antagonist, Buchanan, uh, I forget his first name. He he gives us such a sense of this person's physicality and how powerful he is that it doesn't even matter. He's wearing effeminate riding pants, you know, and it's a cruel body. And that word choice, that phrase stands out. And then he moves us into this room where the two women are laying on couches and the curtains are billowing softly in the breeze and the women are lounging like they've been exhausted by the humidity of the day and they're dressed all in white and their dresses are kind of gauzy and so that description is narrative exposition in a first person where Nick is being an excellent witness providing the reader with tremendous characterization and mood, we really get a sense of stepping into a life of luxury where these ladies have nothing better to do than lounge about. And the man has just been riding his polo pony. And there's such a sense of entitlement 
And he doesn't have to tell us that. He doesn't have to resort to dialogue. You know, they don't have a butler step in and then snap at him to go get them a new drink or something. It's just in the sense of the space we're entering as readers, right? So when you encounter passages that affect you, take note. (laughs) Mm. And ask why. Study them. Don't just go, oh, wow, that moved me. But okay, what did the writer do here? Why did this affect me as a reader? Mm-hmm. Also, I think one of the reasons why we follow authors, because you, your books are memorable maybe because of a character or a, an, an emotional state that it left you with and you, you might want to be drawn to reread them. But a new book comes out by an author, why do we gravitate to them? You know, why do we think, and it, and it could be a different in a genre, a different genre, um, somebody who genre hops a bit and you think, mm-hmm. oh, great, another book by, you know, whoever it might be. Um, and one of the reasons why we do that is because we know that whatever they produce, it, it will have a strong voice of some description. Now, sometimes that doesn't gel. You can see the fans of other work have come in and said, oh, really don't like Jim Butcher in this series mm-hmm. because it's too wiffly waffly or whatever. You know, I, I want the zappy action of Dresden, not this other stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and, but, you know, nonetheless, you know, there are people that appreciate both um, mm-hmm. or multi- multiple. And I think we're drawn to authors who are capable of building a stronger fabric than just a character or just a plot. So right. it's, it's it's you can't really under, underestimate the impact of of narrative. I mean, it's, it's a stupid statement. You can't <laughs> underestimate the impact of a story. Um, uh huh. But you know, I don't know how often I actually treat it separately. So it's it's useful to have a you know have a discussion about it to to give it that extra finesse. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I find um, when a story is weak on narrative, when it is all focused on plot and dialogue, and let's assume it's doing that well enough to reach Mm. readers, right? I'm not just talking about a failure, Mm. but Mm. when doing that well enough, it's it's like disposable reading, Mm. you know? Definitely. Um, I had a professor... Yeah, yeah. I had a professor who worked for one of the big romance publishers, uh, maybe as an intern, something, (laughs) where he had to do this task of uh, women would send in, or readers, maybe not all women, presumably mostly women, would send in their receipts on which they had bought one of these romance novels, and then they would be mailed a new book that had just come out. And um, so he was going through these grocery store receipts and they'd have their groceries and then like 10 romance novels. And it opened his eyes to the buying habits of these voracious readers who would go to that wire rack by the checkout lane and they would just grab books, right? And they would read them very fast and on to the next one and trade them with friends. And in one sense, that's all great because they're buying lots of books and, Mm. you know. But on the other hand, those are books being consumed fast, very, very fast. So Mm. it's like the snack that leaves you empty. And they aren't putting them on their bookcase and loving them and thinking I might reread this next year, right? They're like, okay, next, here you go, pass Mm -hmm. this on to a friend. And so, you know, with all due respect to those types of books and readers, it is a different sort of story than Mm -hmm. one that is narrative rich, one that, you know, leaves you feeling full and satisfied. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, before we we sound too too snobby, I mean, it's a, a, there's they're just different forms of, as you say, it's a different a different menu. So you know, one day you might feel like a burger and chips, the next day you want to make a you know seven course degustation. You know, so it's, it right. depends on on one's mood. And I, I think what you say gives hope for those people who 
who can't churn out books fast because there's no question that in the romance field, if you want to continue to have a following, you've probably got to pump them out pretty quickly um, because of the right. consumption. But if right. you're writing something that has a uh, that also has, whether you write it fast or slowly, has a, a compelling narrative, then you can probably keep readers more on the following the author than necessarily the next hit. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the fact you might only release one a year, they'll wait for it because they know it's something worth savouring, like a, right. you know, a special meal. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, right. just, I think, you know, it is different if you put the business hat on it's a different business model completely yeah um, it is it's, and it's drawing not, that distinction between the narrative style is, is a good one right and i'm not trashing romance writers no, no, or romance as a were. genre it was just this particular example happened to yeah. be with the romance publisher and that sort of story consumption and another thing this professor said was that um you know because the author name brings the following they would have kind of factory writing situations where the author with the name that has the following would turn in an outline and then ghost writers yeah. would mm -hmm. very very quickly churn out the story so and i just bring that up as an example of a kind of fiction where voice doesn't really matter those aren't the points, those aren't the, you know, the reason people engage. That yeah. isn't the reason people engage yeah. in that <laughs> in that kind of story. And it's the, what we think of as a beach read, right? Mm -hmm. So, anyway. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> play with that. So what you're saying is you can play with your narrative, keep, you know, keeping it shallow, keeping it easy, keeping it not, or making it deeper right this is your water with the fish and it will change the reader's experience yes yeah 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 the narrative style and voice changes the reader's experience and while you can have a book that is you know almost wholly character and action uh it's a very different kind of story than one where the narrative is crafted mm -hmm. right and Actually, I've been thinking about True Grit this week because I'm using it in, um, in the course I'm about to teach. And this is such an un awesome, and you got the right, <laughs> got the teacher's edition. Um, this is such an unusual story. We've got this first person narrator with this kind of strained style of speaking i mean it's historical so i don't mean strained like mm. but maddie ross is you know not laid back and um there's even some epistolary in here she uses a court transcript to introduce rooster cogburn uh she goes into her point of narration which has to be at least 1920, because it's post Volstead Act, it's post when Prohibition was enacted, you know, but the story itself is, um, I forget what year it's set, but the pre-1900. And, you know, and she makes commentary on the socio-political uh, times and events and such. And I have called this book literary and been you know, shot down by my friends who are like, this is genre fiction, this is a Western. Yeah, but look at it. Look at the actual mm. text, you know, literary Western. It's also a New York Times bestseller, an American masterpiece, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, two movies. So you can write genre fiction. You can write mm. a Western adventure tale with, you know, death as the ultimate stake for your protagonist with a pistol on the cover and still have an intense narrative experience. Mm -hmm. And that does work with readers or this wouldn't have so many accolades and two mm -hmm. movie adaptations. Right. So, um, yeah. 
<laughs> I am pro genre fiction and pro literary fiction, and I'm just pro narrative. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Think yeah. About your narrative, people. Well, up with narrative. Yeah, when well, you mentioned noir anyway earlier on, and you know, there's a very good example of an expectation from a reader on the narrative style, um, not necessarily just dialogue. And if you look at you know, the masters of that, like Elmore Leonard, etc., then they have a very distinctive voice and and a readership because of that. Mm-hmm. And that would be if you if you wanted to to study that sort of terse, choppy, noir style, then, and this, I would say that's really right. literary. It's as literary yeah. as, the, as the purple prose stuff right. that comes out of, you know, some of our historical masterpieces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, voice should be appropriate to the story you're telling. Yeah. And genre is, you know, the category the story you're telling falls under. So if you're writing a noir detective story, you should have a voice that suits that story. Yeah. There's no one, it is not one voice fits all. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com. <laughs>